All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Andy Gospodarik. Um, uh, as the slide says, I work at Broadcom. Uh, so I want to do this moonshot talk. Um, the great news is, uh, it, or maybe bad news, is there's nothing about NVMe. So if you were, uh, you know, a change of pace from the last two talks, that's OK. It's great technology, but this is nothing about that. And uh, other good news, uh, I have no slides, because none of this is actually implemented. So that's super cool, too. Um, but we've been seeing a lot of interest in telemetry in general uh, from uh, customers and potential customers. And there's two uh, to three sort of standards that exist. And wanted to sort of talk about those and just highlight those and kind of encourage us to think a little bit um, a little bit earlier. Uh, there's always discussions about do we do development in the right way? Do we wait for hardware to have support and then do the work? I had this discussion last week, or do we, earlier this week, or, or do we uh, find ways to do it before hardware supports there? So uh, this is maybe a little bit of an encouraging talk to have us think about doing some of these things before the hardware is ready. So I'll give you a brief introduction. I don't know why I'm looking up there. I can look here. Um, anyway, so hopefully it's not too much of an eye chart if you need to bring your binoculars. Um, so the idea behind telemetry is this a, sort of a generic method for collecting network state. But it's oftentimes on the packets as they traverse the network. So you're not looking at uh, necessarily a, a, a special agent or any, any special, um, a little bit of an agent, but nothing, nothing third party. The idea is we could have this native to the kernel. Um, so the, the way this works is that packets have uh, these telemetry instructions inserted um, in a, a supported device would read these instructions and based on what's there would add some metadata to traffic as it flows through. So there's sort of two ways that we think about this. So these, these telemetry instructions are added in situ, which is, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is, I believe, um, one of the more popular ways. So it goes on existing frames. So in other words, you're adding data to things as they go through your network. Um, this obviously has, could be problematic, could be great. Uh, we'll talk about some of those issues. Or, in many cases, it could be on a sample of the frames. So in the event that you don't want to don't in, insert this directly in your data path, uh, but you want to still use the same data path, you could sample a frame, add the data, possibly truncate the data uh, so that you're not above the MTU. And, and those would be transmitted basically simultaneously with the, the frames that were cloned. Um, so there's sort of three things you probably, you may have heard of uh, IOAM. Uh, this is kind of an extension um, that's been proposed in a variety of frame formats. Uh, VXLAN in particular, VXLAN GPE has support for this. Um, there's a little, bit of, a little bit of knowledge of this in the kernel right now. In fact, there's actually the, the extensive knowledge that exists for uh, IOAM in the VXLAN driver. It just says, oh, here's an IOAM header. Yeah, I don't know what to do with that. Uh, don't. Just know that it's OK, and we'll just, we'll just move on, um, which is fine. I mean, it's better than dropping the packet altogether, uh, which is kind of the case a while ago. There's also INT, in-band network telemetry, and IFA, in-band flow analysis. And these are, all, these are all ways that we can implement this sort of generic network telemetry feature set. All right, so uh, I shamelessly took this uh, picture directly from um, the I, one of the IFA uh, IETF drafts. Um, it was much easier, uh, apparently, to cut and paste this ASCII art than it was for me to draw something new. Um, so we're going to talk about these main components. Um, the key that you see, there's three really key pieces you see. You see an initiator, and really four. An initiator node, uh, a transit node, um, terminating node. Now, I'm a little disappointed as a native English speaker that we didn't um, call this a terminator node. Uh, that would be much cooler, much more fun. Um, conjure up all sorts of thoughts about uh, that future for us. Um, and, uh, and then the collector node. So we'll go through each one of these components. All right, the source of the initiator node. So in this case, we have a flow that comes in. And the idea behind all these technologies is that you're not sampling every packet. That you might say, you know, I want to understand what the flow of this application is inside my data center until it exits the network, what ECMP host is going through where it's happening, uh, what the latency is, all these details. So a flow comes into an initiator node. Uh, this initiator node notes that it is one it cares about. In this case, we're going to talk about an IFA flow that's cloned. So we're not doing the traffic. We're not doing it in situ. We're actually cloning it. And this IFA initiator node 
is going to add the telemetry instructions. So this is something configured by your data center administrator, your IFA administrator. Again, could be in band, could be out of band. In this particular example, I have drawn it as out of band, so cloned. All right, the next is a transit node. So these are the nodes that are going to provide us interesting information. They're going to notice that a telemetry instruction exists. They're not doing any cloning. They're, they're only adding data in line. So uh, this is the, the piece that's most um, it, that's critical in a lot of ways because this is what's going to give you information as you traverse through the network. And um, it's only again, it's only going to add telemetry data to frames that contain telemetry instructions and these IFA or INT headers. We'll talk about what those look like in a little bit. And then we have a, a sync or a terminating node or a, termi a terminator node. Um, and these, uh, these remove telemetry headers from frames, send them to a collector. Not really that complex. So in two cases, the two different wor you know, workflows you think about, if this is a frame that was modified as it traversed your network, an in situ frame or an in band, you take the telemetry instructions out, the telemetry data. You may or may not send it to a collector node. One of the keys uh, about this is that there's no guarantee that you send everything to a collector. Um, part of these, the idea behind this is that if you're within um, what you would consider to be an acceptable range, whether it's latency, whether it's number of hops, other things, there's no reason to send, send this to your collector to maybe not overload your collector. Um, when you're talking about you know, terabit networking speeds, um, this could be a lot of data even at 1%. Um, if, uh, if it is a cloned frame, um, what will happen is you just you drop it when you're done. You don't need to send it on. So that's one of the advantages to cloning. You look at the data, take out what you need, drop the flame, frame on the floor, you're done. All right, so these are the, these are the key components. The last one, the collector, of course. Uh, and this is any generic application will receive, receive this data uh, from a sync or terminating node. So. Initiator, transit, terminator, pretty simple stuff. All right, so first one we'll talk about is, is in-band network telemetry. So this is kind of, I think, the first one of the, of the two we'll talk about today that appeared. Uh, it's really a framework that you see suggested by P4 Group. The idea is it's in-band monitoring, so as the frames traverse the network. This is somewhat unsurprising if you think about P4 as a programmable pipeline that they have this opportunity to, to do things right in the middle because they're defining everything as they go. Um, so no, no fixed function uh, worries there. Um, so this, the, uh, the in-band telemetry, um, the INT spec is pretty large and it goes over a pretty significant number of frame formats. Apparently that's, li okay, all right, we're back, excellent. All right, um, this side of the room didn't notice. Uh, so they, it goes over INT over VXLAN. So again, this is like, this is like what we talked about with IOM, a GPE extension. Has INT over Geneve, INT over GRE, um, over Network Service Center, all, all sorts of different ways. Um, and then they talk just a little bit at the end, like, oh, well, here's how you do it if IPv, IPv4, IPv6, and if it's a standard TCP or UDP payload. I think when you think about that, um, this standard as it is, is really designed to um, use a lot of those same overlay technologies that are used across the data center. So it's, it's not surprising. Um, in, this, in this case, the, the IPv4, IPv6 standard stuff, the, the header is added and the metadata, they're transparently added to the payload. So sounds like it seems relatively reasonable. If we were again to look at a completely stolen from the uh, spec frame format, IP header, layer 4 header, now we have our our INT shim, it's got some information, and our INT metadata that's been added, and our payload at the end. The important part to think, think about with these three, these last three bits, is technically those are all seen as the payload, uh, as far as the, um, the first two headers are concerned. So, all right, see who's paying attention, who's awake. Who, who attended a talk yesterday that might, might cause problems here? Anybody have any ideas? Okay, why would quick be a problem? Okay. So, yeah, the, the key here is that if, if quick is expected, well, and you're absolutely right. I was kind of even thinking about a different angle. So if your payload is expected to be encrypted and you're thinking about this quick, you're obviously going to run into problems if, like, you could have issues. Um, 
the great thing about all these is they're all going to have some issues. Um, <laughs> It's just, this is the way it works, right? They're all gonna have they're all gonna have some problems, but I think um, the thing is, people are people are really interested in this, so we've got to we've got to be ahead of it or be aware of it. So I think the fact that it's inserted in the payload could be somewhat problematic, um, especially as you say, like the way it, boxes. I mean, this is something that is running kind of on middle boxes, so we're, maybe we're part of the problem with Quick uh, or part of the problem for Quick. But I think this is important to think about um, the the payload being. Um, being sort of faked um, in this case. Um, so, yeah, all right. I can. Oh, there's a button. Maybe I, maybe I have the second mic. So in this case, what is, what is the protocol in the IP header? In this case, it's the same protocol as it was before. It's TCP? So TCP. How can this possibly work if I'm putting data into the TCP stream? Yeah, I, <laughs> there's, so there's parts about it. So you could, if you extract it before someone else consumes it, it could work in theory. <laughs> Are people actually doing this in real life? This, I don't know. Yeah, OK. No, no, so uh, Tom, the answer is the expectation is that you do, the INT data doesn't leave the INT network, right? That's right. So, so the th this is actually, thank you, this is an important point that I think I added to a version three of these slides that didn't exist. Let me go back. Um, but it's right here. All right, so the last piece I didn't mention this whole thing. So thank you. The, the, um, but what does INT network mean then? I'm getting ready to say it. Excellent segue. Thank you, Jamal. <laughs> Um, so at the bottom, you can see this is, these are considered within an IFA domain. So um, from the initiator node, the beginning to the, to the terminating node, uh, this is considered the domain. And the idea would be this is inside your data center. So the, the, the problematic part about this is it's not designed to exit your data center, which is maybe good, maybe bad. Um, so I mean, from a consumption standpoint, obviously, the idea is that the remote device doing the reception of these frames would already have the INT data removed from it. So you mentioned that you had the slides with the overland networks. Can you go there? Like the, um, Absolutely. Um, so you, maybe. You, when you say that it's, it's convenient in, uh, for VXLAN and Geneva, you, you mean that the VTEP does that? Or like you do the telemetry where you do the encapsulation in the same point in the fabric? Or? You could, yes. Mm. Um, I think the other option is that for the, for the uh, GPE extension, you could add the INT data there. So if, if the encapsulation had already been done, the standard supports um, the extension to do that. Okay. I didn't write the standard, just yeah, so it's, it's clear. <laughs> <laughs> and I, well, and I've given, so, all right. These are all fair questions, though. I mean, I'll, I'm happy to answer them as best I can. Um, all right, so I think we've gone, so I want to move on to IFA, because I think, um, personally, I think this one's a little more interesting. Um, and so the, it was the, the first version of this uh, was released a little bit later. Um, I mean, these things are new enough. So we had the IFA 1.0, I think we're calling it that. The first version of it was released uh, late last year. And there's actually a second version that came out, uh, I think, in February. So these things are actually moving pretty fast. Um, so uh, the idea behind it is that not only can you add telemetry instructions and then metadata, uh, in band if you'd like. It also provides the capability to do sampling and send it out of band. So the sampling one is interesting because it actually um, probably allows uh, hardware or devices in the middle <clears throat> that maybe don't have native support in their data path for doing this. Uh, it allows them to have the opportunity to sample a packet, maybe have it run on a host CPU and do something different. Now, of course, you're going to get a little bit of, uh, you're going to have some latency there. but um, I think this one of the reasons I think this is interesting. Um, also, when we talk about the sampling case, the frames can be dropped on the way out. Uh, you don't have to deal with them. And the frame format, the aim is for it to be a little bit more compatible with hardware. Um, everyone will probably notice some of the issues with that right here. Um, so in this case, if we had an IPv4 TCP frame, now what we have is actually our IP header. Um, then we have an IFA header inserted. Then we have our layer 4 data. 
So the way this is done differently is the next protocol for IP, instead of being um, TCP or UDP, in this case, it'll be, it, it would be specified as something that IFA. Now, right now, there's no uh, IANA reserved address for this, so anyone doing this work um, would be doing this probably on one of the two experimental ones, so 253 or 254. Um, so you, so in, in that case, um, any middle boxes that are there might end up not quite knowing what to do with this, and in that case, um, it's not unexpected, but it's a little bit different than, than the way this is designed to do. The, the idea is that you're not going to skip devices. Um, but in fact, uh, the protocol actually outlines uh, ways to look at um, TTLs that have been decremented or other, other indicators that a packet's been forwarded without metadata being added. So this is one of the things that can actually detect is, hey, there's a box in my network that's, that's doing something to these packets. It's maybe forwarding these packets, maybe not. Um, and uh, is not participating uh, in IFA, so we we love we love participation. So you know we don't want to don't want to have that. Um, but again, now we haven't we haven't taken this. Oops, sorry. So we haven't taken this and um, sort of faked out our payload. Uh, it's fairly well known, and this is fairly it's well described. Um, so as I mentioned in here, the protocol would be um, something that would mark it as IFA. Uh, if you're implementing this today. I said maybe you'd use 253 or 254, since those are left uh, as experimental. Um, in theory, they'd, they'd, there'd be a reservation made for that. I don't know that the standard has pushed themselves to the point where they're ready to make a reservation. Um, so those are the kind of the key components. So, all right, Tom's got another question. Excellent. Keep me on my game. OK, uh, so can you go back one slide? Okay, so IPv4, what about IPv6? Yeah, I, IPv6 has the, it's the same idea. Um, you specify the protocol, um, the next protocol as IFA. Um, it, there are, it does also outline um, what you're going to want to hear, which is using extension headers uh, for some of this information. Okay, so, so let's talk about IPv6 for one second. Sure. Why would you need a new protocol if we have extension headers that already have all the functionality? A great question. Okay, so if you accept premise number A, go back to the IPv4. Um, I think last week or two weeks ago, I posted the internet draft that sa says how to use extension headers in IPv4. Mm -hmm. So now, instead of having an IFA protocol, you could just use a hop by hop option, and you can get exactly the same format in IPv6. No new protocol necessary. That would be awesome. That'd be awesome. But okay, so who do I talk about <laughs> oh, yeah. to make sure that happens? Because this is exactly perfect in that sense. Yeah, um, we'll, yeah we'll talk afterwards. Cool. Uh, Tom, isn't that hop by hop? Hop by hop options. Yeah. Yeah, that's Th yeah this is going to give you a little bit more information. Um, so, 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 so part of the problem here, right, is like was said earlier, the, the analysis traffic is supposed to be data center wide, not necessarily okay. hop by hop or not aggregated at any uh, hop. Right? So, so read up on hop by hop options. What they are is <laughs> you can put these in a packet. They can be inspected by intermediate hops. They can be modified. Um, there's a way to do that. So one of the problems um, on that slide that had Geneve and VXLAN and stuff like that, they're in UDP. And if we have devices going into UDP and modifying payload, there's a fundamental problem because the way you identify those as being the payload you're interested in is by destination port. However, destination port are not um, reserved. So for instance, the Geneve port number, I can use that in my data center to be any traffic I want. And if I have something going into packets and modifying um, data because they think it's something else than it actually is, we have silent data corruption. So the idea of, of going into UDP packets and modifying data, even in the data center, is very risky. Oh, I'm, I'm not arguing against the risky part. <laughs> the, the design here is fairly simple. Switches, uh, go, while traffic is going through, we'll insert this into, because they're all anywhere tracking the header separately from the payload. So they'll insert this data in between the header and the payload and pass it on effectively. Yeah, but, but the, but the da data in that case is actually the payload. So no. like Andy said, we, we want this to be in headers outside of the payload between the IP header and the actual 
transport. Then there's very few ways. Actually, that's right. only one way to actually do that's that correctly. Right. No, no, that's right. So I think you're right. I mean, the, these guys came up with, like, we'll just stick it in the front of the payload. Yeah. I'm interested to see how this works in TCP yeah. still. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so one of the things I wanted to do, to, now that I've given you this brief introduction uh, to these technologies, uh, just talk about how this would fit in the Linux ecosystem, um, what kind of components we need, what kind of modifications we need. So I broke down each node and what, what, what we would need to get some of this done. Uh, some of these are not completely functional, uh, but these are ideas of, of where we could do this. Uh, and all right, so the key sort of operations for initiator is to sample, easily TC net filter, we can do both these now. Mirror, TC does this now. Uh, redirecting the packets, we can either do this with TC um, or um, everybody's favorite, we can do XTP or eBPF programs to do this. Um, and then if we want to do encapsulate and transmit, uh, the interesting part about this is that uh, encapsulating and putting in this frame format would be something that would be really very similar actually to the recent sort of kernel edition for ER span. So we're talking about taking a frame that was there already, putting it inside sort of another header, uh, adding some more, some more information. So we could do um, similar to, the, to how that's done right now, which is lightweight tunnels, um, the new net dev type. Um, we could also, again, because you can do everything with XCP or eBPF, you could do it there. Um, so if we're going to do a transit hop, um, match, we're going to match on this INT or IFA frame. We can do this with TC, no problem. Update the metadata. Again, I think the right, the right option here is to consider using uh, a new lightweight tunnel type. Um, in the sync node or the terminating node, again, TC, net filter, both of those can do this. Um, collect the metadata, consider sending it on, sending it, uh, and then transmitting it the original frame in the INT case or the IFA non-sampled case. Um, again, I think the right, the right probably mode here is um, to consider using a lightweight tunnel type. Um, same situation. So the, the cool thing is that Linux kernel has a lot of these building blocks already in place to allow us to support this new technology, this new thing. Um, and I think that's kind of nice. They're all going to require a little bit of modification. Uh, a lot of the mirroring, for example, and sampling is actually thought of typically right now is on the receive side, whereas this would be typically done on the transmit side. But either way, um, it's cool. We're close. Uh, and can you go to the slide? Which node is the one that adds the telemetry? The, the, the transit node, or the transit hop is the one that, I'm sorry, repeat your question. The, which one of, is the node that actually adds the telemetry data? So this, the transit hop adds it along the way. So the source node or the initiator node is the one that does the sampling of the traffic and decides to add the instructions. Yes, this one. This one. So how do you suggest to add the, to model the adding of the instruction? By a lightweight tunnel? Yes. Because if you do the matching in TC, you, you don't want to, you can also add the Tunnel in TC, no? The, um, the header, no? Or you want to do it with a tunnel? Okay. So, because a lot of the fields are configurable, it felt like doing it in lightweight tunnel. With, with a lightweight tunnel felt like a better, uh, felt like a good option. And but, as, and I'm right. not married to all these these, okay. these ideas, but. Um, and when you say packet sampling with TC, you refer to the sample uh, action. Yeah. Ah, good. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I, I agree with with or you could. You could do the encapsulation with G Geneve in, in TC. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, we could do it there too. Um, okay. All right. So um, nothing would be complete without uh, sort of thinking beyond the kernel data path a little bit. So uh, as was mentioned, um, you know, switch hardware is probably going to people going to people are interested in this. You can you can know that. Um, you know, INT is backed by sort of P4, and there are clearly people building switches based on P4. Um, but that's, of course, not limited to programmable data planes. Um, and really, customer demand is going to dictate whether or not this is supported on, you know, only something with programmable data planes or more fixed function devices. Um, yeah. Another comment that uh, <laughs> Tommy will be happy to hear that. So wh while you start playing with all this telemetry data, I think the importance of support for checksum complete will be, uh, so guys, so far only the Melox driver supports checksum complete. You're gonna, really gonna mess if you're not gonna support it soon. Uh, and another comment is that um, with the kernel data pass, 
um, because the packet traverses between the layers in the kernel, and the and the headers are being taken into the uh, into the cache. The overhead of checksum complete is not doesn't exist, but in DPDK it's a real mess because in DPDK the 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 driver it's only a driver right it's not a stack, so uh, they only they 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 do not put the L L three and L four headers into the cache, and in Mellanox when we did experiments in forcing checksum complete, uh, there it was a disaster because they have to so so DPDK is is really in deep shit <laughs> with this. Uh, with this, can, can I quote you on that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't understand the problem. So DPDK doesn't look at L3 and L4 headers. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? So why would you want DPDK drivers to do that? Because if you wanted to take a checksum complete and form it into a checksum, okay, you have to right, you have to subtract the part. Right, but so this an overhead. But but DPDK I don't understand. I'm, I'm, I'm missing something fundamental. So DPDK is just getting a raw frame. It, it has to look at the L3 and L4 headers, right? It has to take the cache mess. Or am I missing something? I, I love the healthy discussion, but can I try to? Yeah, OK, time, sorry. Time, time, I appreciate guys. it. <coughs> uh, um, last question. OK, well, let me, all right, yeah, go Do ahead. Do you have slides still? Uh, I, think I, I think, well, let me just say this. Yeah, so the, the other thing, again, sort of like I said before, um, like Switch Hardware, Nick Hardware is going to have support as people ask for it. Uh, it's unsurprising to think about it in that way. Um, yeah, the rest of these, um, one, of the other thing, one of the other pieces for us to just be aware of is that uh, network-based configuration, so something where your device is actually being configured um, remotely is something that's um, an interesting data center trend. Um, so the, the hardest part is whether you know it or not, there's going to be a chance that you're going to have a Nick or you're going to have a Switch um, that has this feature. Uh, turned on and it's happening and you don't know about it, uh, which is not great. Um, so we probably actually need to really pay attention and make sure that kernel support and other infrastructure supports there before uh, it, it's it's there without us knowing it. Um, I'm going to quote Orr on DBDK being in deep shit, um, but uh, no, that DBD. Oh, yeah, I'll get to your question. Yeah. What, what type of evidence is there that you know processing of these headers in a switch in the middle could be done at reasonable cost without adding delay, right? Because I think the applications want to see the performance of traffic without that, and you know. Yeah, I think that's why the the um, out of band or the sampled based one is the most attractive, um, because you're you're taking your regular data plane is still running, and you've got this extra packet that's hopefully not too much extra packet because it's on a per float too much extra network load, it's sampled. <coughs> on a per flow basis. So, I mean, evidence, I think the proof will be in implementation. Um, uh, so yeah, we're out of time, I guess. Yes. Thank you. Yep. I'm negative, negative okay. 36 seconds.